Hi, I'm Jen and welcome to Christian Fire Poppy. That Rachel from Women and the Priesthood is putting together funds and she's going to be helping people that have experienced the devastation of Hurricane Helene in North Carolina. She lives there, the Relief Society, the church is doing so much to help the people there. She will be covering that on her channel, but we wanted to sponsor her and her efforts on our channel today. And so Dave and I are going to match donations up to thousand dollars. So when you donate, I'll put that link where you can click on it and donate money to the cause to help the Helene hurricane victims that will be in the description. But when you click on that, you can put a note. And if you put a note that says Christian fire poppy, then we will match up to $1,000 of that um, just to help them out. So thanks. Since today was such a special and historical general conference, I thought it would be only be appropriate to bring my husband on the channel for the first time. This is my husband, David Stevens. We are approaching our 20 year anniversary. We have five kids together and we were married in the Nauvoo Temple. So we're approaching that special 20 year anniversary. We're actually going on a cruise pretty soon to celebrate. So we'll have to definitely come back to the cruise analogy that was given in general conference. Well, do you want to share a little bit about what our general conference at home looks like with our five kids? Sure, it's a real pleasure to be here. I always get to sort of be in the back room watching this happen. And so it's a real treat to actually be a part of one of these videos. So thank you for having me. Um, I flew very far out to be here with you today. So. Um, our conference. And we're both getting over a cop, so we'll try not to laugh too much. It's usually okay if we don't laugh. We swear we're Serious. not contagious via YouTube. That's right. Um, geez, such a wonderful conference. Our conferences are always such a wonderful mix of, of spirituality with chaotic child play. Um, we gather a lot of snacks and treats. We lay out the picnic blanket and we all gather in front of the television, much like the uh, people of Benjamin put up their tent and gathered around the tower to, watch, to listen to the prophets. Uh, we draw pictures, we play bingo, and we uh, have good frank gospel discussions uh, throughout the whole thing. So it's a real treat. That's right. So it's a great time to gather with a family and I'm sure all of you had the same experience. And it's also fun to get on YouTube and to just discuss it, how exciting it was, the things that were said. And I feel like we have to start with what the prophet President Nelson said because that was stunning. So I have my notes and I'm going to just recap a few things that he said because I don't even think I could say any commentary that would be more exciting than the exact words that he said. So I was pretty on top of taking notes and recording what it was he said. So this is what I have recorded. So there might be some, you know, things that are not exactly correct, but I was, I was being pretty careful. So he said, let's see. He says, he, Jesus Christ, will bless you and heal you and heal your wounded souls. Your burdens will feel lighter. Make and keep your covenants and your burden will be temporary and affliction swallowed up in the joy of Jesus Christ. It is not too late to become a devout disciple of Jesus Christ. And in a coming day, Jesus Christ will return to the earth as a millennial Messiah. So today, I call upon you to, re to rededicate your lives to Jesus Christ. I call you to help gather scattered Israel and prepare the world for the second coming. Talk of Christ, testify of Christ, have faith in Christ, rejoice in Christ, and your whole soul to enjoy because the best is yet to come because the Savior is coming again. So that's what we're doing today. We're talking of Christ. We are rejoicing in Christ. That is why I have a channel. And I love this because he says the best is yet to come because the Lord is hastening his work. And at his second coming, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together and be filled with joy. And he says, I've declared this truth to you and to all the world in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So those are just from my notes. We'll get to hear the exact quotes when they come and they print it out. But when I heard that, it was so strong. There was such an emphasis on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I think after we talk about this, we'll have to shift right into what Elder Stevenson said, because that goes hand in hand with what our prophet said. So 
What did you think about the prophet's words? <laughs> it was exactly what you said. I feel like uh, as a prophet of our church, uh, they're always careful on when they're mentioned of the second coming because they, of course, don't want to uh, incite uh, too much exuberance with things like that. And so they save it for special occasions. And yet Elder President Nelson pulled out all the stops here, not only an introduction with the second coming, but also his conclusion. Uh, and then sandwiched in between there was the message that he wanted us to have, which was uh, preparing for his coming uh, by doing many things, including most notably to me was going to the temple. Gee, if I had a nickel for every time it was mentioned, both this conference and last conference, but I, I'm just yeah. shocked at how much uh, the apostles and prophets have been pushing us to go to the temple. I've heard it more than any other aspect of the gospel. Um, and it's just, as I'm listening to it, I feel like, geez, I better make an appointment and take my kids and, and worship more often at the temple even than what I'm doing right now. That reminds me, Elder Alvarado, I, I wrote, this was a pretty stunning quote. He said, what will open the heavens more than worshiping in the temple? Nothing. So there you go. That's the answer to that. And so kind of pivoting into what Elder Stevenson said, this was amazing for him to talk about tenure. So first of all, I just want to recognize that so many people who are looking forward to the second coming kind of have this focus on 2034. So this is just going to spark so much excitement within people that are looking forward to the second coming because that's just a hot time. And so for the church to be hosting the Olympics and then to have an apostle talk about this next decade. So in my last video, I kind of highlighted how this was the general conference of 100s. It was the 100th year of general conference being broadcast and we have a 100 year old prophet and just i love that symbolism and the the number imagery of 10 tens right so 100 is 10 tens and then to have elder stevenson get up and talk about the next 10 years so let me again i i was very careful to go back and to write down what he said so let me share with you what he said about he said the history of the church is resplendent with divine experiences that demonstrate how the Lord has guided his church. There is one decade in our history, however, that stands strikingly supreme above any other. The decade from 1820 to 1830, we have a frog in the background, <laughs> beginning with Joseph Smith's experience in the sacred grove. In the spring of 1820, when we saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, continuing until April 6, 1830, and then he says that that decade is, like any, is not like any other. And then he goes on to say this, and this really was bold, and he prefaces it that way. He said, may I be so bold to suggest that this year we have commenced, so this year, 2024, you guys know I've always had big feelings about this year. Okay, so that this year will have commenced a decade that may prove to be as momentous as any that has followed that unparalleled founding decade between 2024 and 2034 we will experience seminal events that will result in extraordinary opportunities to serve, to unite with members and friends, and to introduce the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to more people than ever before. So that's amazing. He is highlighting the, these next 10 years as being similarly seminal as when Joseph Smith received the gospel. So, and we already know we have that promise from President Nelson about seeing some of the greatest miracles, and that's pretty exciting. So just to give you a little bit of reference, I'm a much more excitable, enthusiast person. My husband is the skeptic. He's the grounded one. And so what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm excited about it all. I'm like, oh, of course, you know. Um, but what is your perspective from a more skeptical, <laughs> or just at least less excitable? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I was really excited by what Elder Stevenson had to say combined with what President Nelson has to say. I mean, geez. Uh, you know, often you go into, you hear about these job interview questions or college interview questions where they say, uh, where do you see yourself in five years? What, what's your 10 year plan? And uh, the idea of the question is to kind of grab at what's important to you, what your plan moving forward is. Uh, is. And I feel like this conference was really pushing us to refocus on Christ and uh, as, as added incentive for that, uh, helping us to realize that our 10-year plan is going to be filled with these amazing milestones given to us by the church, 
by the Lord in the, the sort of things that we're going to see in, the, in society and across the earth. And uh, so we better <laughs> make sure that we are prepared and that we are of the right mindset, that we have Christ at the front of our lives so that uh, these things will feel glorious and wonderful, uh, that the great and terrible day of the Lord will be great for us and not terrible. So something else I noticed in his talk that I loved is if you've been watching my previous videos, we have been talking about the symbolism of mountains. And I love how Elder Hurst talked about thinking celestial literally. And then he talked about stepping back from those things that are in front of you, right? Your own little life. And just literally looking up at the stars in heaven and thinking about how God is over all of these things. So that really, that really explains my purpose in my channel when I talk about the heavens. And I love to kind of just step back and literally look at the heavens and just think in symbolic terms. And one of those things that I think is really cool from an astronomical viewpoint is that, I mean, starting right now, so last weekend you could see there is a comet that you could see that hasn't been in this area visible for 50,000 years. So they talk about it's been since forever since you could see it, it's called Suchinsan Atlas, and Suchinsan means purple mountain. So thinking of the imagery and symbolism of the mountain has really been on my mind. And so I was so excited when in general conference this time, they talked about the mountain symbolism over and over and over again. And I think it's really important when it comes to the second coming. So this is what Elder Stevenson said about mountains when he was talking about the Salt Lake City Temple renovation, and he talked specifically about the plaza. He said, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the mountains and the top of the hills. And then he explained how this was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. So I looked it up and it's Isaiah chapter two, verse two. Go ahead and read that, but it's that mountain one. And he talks about how all nations will flow into the temple and how when the Salt Lake City Temple is, reded is rededicated and opened, nations from all over are gonna flow and that we are going to invite our friends and families. And this is gonna be this real hub and center of the church. And I think it's a symbolism, just a big symbol of the church rising up in its glory and the glory of Jesus Christ being manifest. And so that ties in so well to what the prophet was saying about the glory of the Lord. And when I think symbolically of this celestial imagery that we've been talking about, I just always think of that imagery that's given of the woman, of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and that is the new Jerusalem rising up in the glory of the Lord and the glory of the Lord being seen. It's no longer hidden, but as it says in the scriptures that the light of the sun will be increased seven times in the sense of the symbolic of what was once not seen and was veiled will become, I think, slowly unveiled. I think over the next 10 years, the Lord is going to unveil the glory of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on this earth. And we're going to see so many amazing things. And I've just had that feeling, but I feel like the prophet said it so plainly and the apostles have said it so plainly. It's so exciting. And it really all revolves around eternal families and the happiness that, that we receive from these teachings. And what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I think you're exactly right. I, I couldn't help but chuckle a little bit. We weren't together uh, for that session. And so we heard that line separately about stepping back and taking a deeper perspective, perhaps looking up at the skies and seeing the stars. And uh, that made me smile as I thought of your channel here and the many uh, signs and wonders that you've been able to glean from the stars. Um, I think it's a time to be ready to be looking for the signs of the time as the Savior told his disciples. And so I love how, so this is what Elder Hurst said. And he talked about mountains as well. Not only did he talk about thinking celestial literally and looking at the stars, but he said, he said, mountains are evidence of God's love. Those who go to the mountains to receive revelation they find it is a place to retreat into our covenant. So the mountains are a symbol of the temple or going into to seek the face of God. So, and he talks about the love of God and why don't we always feel it? And he talked about grief and depression and betrayal, trial, suffering. We all have those things. And I know my husband and I, we have been through a lot, I would say since 
COVID, we have been through crazy health challenges, both him and I. Um, the house that we're in, building it, innumerable challenges. And I mean, we've just, we've been through a lot. We've been through the ringer. Without <laughs> giving you all of our personal story, it, it's been pretty wild. But I think that those hard things are really what pushed me. And I, I find solace in, as he said, literally looking up at the star celestial and just remembering that God is over all things. It's in his hands. And it helps me to not focus on my own problems and my own things that I'm dealing with. But so he says, he says, experiment patiently, step back. So this is for anybody who's experiencing something hard. He says, step back back again until you are thinking celestial and looking at the stars. If Jesus were to choose a place for you and him to meet, it would probably be in that, that tender place. And you'll find that he's already waiting for you there. And he, anyways, that was really beautiful. Yeah, you know, few things are more inspiring to me than to uh, see the apostles uh, listen to a prophet's voice. Uh, one of President Nelson's big things right now is thinking celestial. And I feel like so many of these talks were using that as a springboard. I, you could could have taken the majority of the talks given this last conference and said they were kind of under the umbrella of the theme of thinking celestial. Uh, sometimes it was about when you're going through hard times, being able to take a perspective uh, farther back. Uh, and many other times it was things like, you know what, we're focusing too much on things that don't matter. I, I heard the reference two times, oh, a lot. Yeah. selling your birthright for a mess of por yes. uh, porridge. They said that so many times. We, we need to take a step back and realize, you know, these, these video games, these, these handheld devices, yeah. watching TV all day, mm -hmm. uh, and so many of the other pursuits that we have that are not in and of themselves bad, become bad if they draw our focus away from the Savior, from thinking celestially. Oh my gosh, and nobody hit that harder than Elder Benner. Mm. Elder Benner start out, started out by quoting <laughs> President Benson, which was amazing, and then he just continued on to, he talked about Samuel the Lamanite, and he just talked about how the Nephites had become more rebellious and more wicked than the Lamanites, and so the Lamanites started receiving the blessings, and he said that, those things, those blessings had turned under cursing because they became more focused on the blessing than Jesus Christ. It became a distraction yeah. and they therefore sold that birthright. Um, but yeah, I heard, I heard that too. And um, one more quote from Elder Hurst that he came back to this. And I heard this a couple of times, quite a few of the apostles, they talked about <coughs> the scripture. He says that, God's own words are that the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but his kindness shall not depart from us. So we should never consider the idea that God has stopped loving us. And then he said, I really enjoy the symbolism of mountains being evidence of the certainty of God's love. And he says that this powerful symbolism weaves into the accounts of those who go to the mountains to receive revelation and Isaiah's description of the mountain of the Lord's house being established in the top of the mountain. So I, of course, love that as well because on my channel, one of my favorite things to do is to weave symbolism and revelation into current events or whatever else that we're talking about. And it just creates meaning and it helps me in my everyday life, you know, just doing little mundane things or reading the news to just weave that symbolism and to remember that the scriptures and God are always with us. Yes. So that was, that was pretty, <laughs> excuse me, oh, the cough is, <laughs> is coming up. Um, so what, what was your favorite talk? What would you say your favorite talk was? Gee, there were so many good ones this time, uh, but I, I loved Elder Kieran. And one of the best parts about conference is okay. that, that we've got so many different kinds of speakers from every walk of life, from so many different countries, different languages, different ages and uh, backgrounds. And so I feel like there's something for everybody. And Elder Kieran really spoke to me this time because I felt like he was, uh, he spoke a little bit about Sabbath worship and um, how he, he did that bit where, you know, we're trying to get our, our kids and maybe ourselves to do that reverence pose for as long as humanly possible. And I, you know, guilty 
Um, <laughs> with five children. I said, don't make me laugh. I said, you can't make me laugh or the cough will come out. I'm fine as long as I don't laugh. Okay, no laughing. It's, it's true. With, with five children on the bench, it's mm -hmm. all I can do to make sure that we don't destroy the Sabbath experience for everybody around us. Um, but we, we work all week and we, we prepare the day of and we make bribes and threats. Hopefully we can have a nice, quiet sacrament meeting. And it doesn't always play out that way, but I really appreciated Elder Kieran's remarks about, you know, we see you. We see you struggling. We see you trying your best and the Lord sees it. And he, he loves that for you. And he knows that sometimes maybe those aren't your most reverent times. Maybe that's during the week that's happening. But at the core of what he said, uh, was the the greatest gem. I feel like this can be applied to almost everywhere uh, Was that worship isn't what's about what's happening out here the outer husk, you know that worship is about what's happening in here um, And I feel like so many of the other speakers seconded him that uh, we need to move away from uh, worrying about what we look like on the outside uh, trying to be a Pharisee or trying to be a frowny face up on the stand. We need to have this joy, this gospel of joy within us, this, this feeling of worship and love and, and dedication and interest in our Savior Jesus Christ inside because that's where the Spirit works. That's where uh, potential becomes reality as far as becoming more like Jesus Christ. I think that's, I think that's so true and Along those same lines, something that really stood out to me was the talk where he talked about meditation. And to me, meditation and worship goes hand in hand. And I've talked about this before. Something that I have found that is very meaningful and helpful is to make my prayers more meditative and to ponder even deeply to receive revelation. Part of my meditation is doing visualizations and making Jesus Christ a part of that. And... It's also a way to worship him, and it's kind of all wrapped up together. And I think that it, I love how he just emphasized it's so important to have that quality. So rather than just checking the box and praying and reading the scriptures that you don't even have to take more time necessarily, but we need to do more mental effort. And I think one of the talks that was given, they talked about lectures on faith. And lectures on faith was really a seminal read for me. And I realized how important that was because it talked about um, how prayer, and I think this seeking and worshiping and pondering is, it's, it takes mental exertion. So there's a certain amount of mental work that we can put into it. And sometimes we don't put that mental work in and we're, we're just checking a box and we're kind of distracted. And so I think it's a skill that we can build upon and work on. And a skill that's lacking in a world where we all have TikTok brain and we're distracted and we have a million things pulling our attention in different directions. So it takes time and practice and we have to consciously do that mental work to get there. And Lectures on Faith is a great read if you want to begin there. And it gives some great ideas, I think, for... So true. You know, I've, I've wondered many times if uh, our lives are so full to the brim. Uh, that we're we're yeah. losing this chance to uh, do as he said to what what was that the Japanese kanji was that do nothing or or it was something like that nothing to do he talked about being the busy was versus yeah, was yeah. The versus the be still be still be still um, and we take we have so little time to be still because uh, whether we're filling our lives with really uh, useless pursuits or whether we're filling our lives with really worthwhile pursuits, which you can do. <coughs> I feel like I'm constantly listening to this, to podcasts or, or I'm listening to, or I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, to apostles and prophets or, or I'm, I'm working in the yard, I'm working in the house, I'm playing with the children. No matter what you're filling your life with, uh, it's still important to take time aside to do nothing or in better said, to be still and to uh, let the Lord in. I specifically liked the, uh, the word of advice to, to pray, and perhaps while you pray, say nothing. You know, just spend some quiet time with the Lord so that perhaps that still small voice might come into you.
really liked how Sister Browning kind of talked about the night again, just coming back to the celestial imagery, because, you know, I just am in awe at celestial imagery. And she talked about how there, they used to say there were nine planets in the solar system, but then they realized that one Dark of them now. was, yeah, <laughs> was actually, <laughs> uh, what did she say, a comet or an asteroid? Um, Planetoid. A planetoid, thank you. <laughs> and she talks about how, you know, we never have complete knowledge on all things. And I thought this was interesting in light of, we have Joseph Smith saying that, you know, we have the prophet saying the second coming is coming. And if we go back to what Joseph Smith said, he said the sign of the Son of Man, he said that the world will call it a planet or a comet. And she is highlighting the fact that the world doesn't always know exactly what is happening, especially up in space. So we can't always just take at face value, like, and let science, you know, trump everything else that we know because science is constantly changing. So that's certainly not a bedrock of truth. And, and science is good. It gives us a place to start, but we need the spirit. Mm -hmm. We need the counsel of the prophet and apostles. And um, anyway, so I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Um, and then I also liked with the celestial imagery, I liked at the beginning how Elder Anderson talked about that story and he used the analogy of an eclipse that if you kind of cast away your belief in God and you just find pleasure in your own intellect, then when bad things happen, that will eclipse your hope. And so, you know, we just had that big ring of fire solar eclipse and I watched that on a video to see how the people in Chile and Argentina viewed that. They all watched and they cheered, kind of like when we had the solar eclipse here on April 8th. And it was so fascinating that both of those were on New Year's Day on the Jewish calendar. You had the civil New Year Day and then the spiritual New Year Day. And I know that the youth are having um, a big thing on the, I think the 27th of this month, and it's a festival of lights and this kind of like celebrating truth. And then it's interesting imagery to think that we're having these huge solar eclipses that so many people are tuning in to watch or to see themselves. And we have this just contrast of light and darkness in the world. And so many people, their faith and their belief is being eclipsed by the teachings of the world and by Satan is getting such a hold on the culture of the people. So I really like how the church is taking hold of this celestial imagery. And it's really, it's really quite beautiful. Um, and then I think one other thing that I just want to touch on is um, I appreciated Elder Irene how he talked about um, being simple in your teachings and also being careful not to speculate too much to avoid speculation. And I felt like that was, I gotta, I gotta be careful about that. Certainly when you're on YouTube, I get on and I get interested and I can easily get off into the weeds. So my husband, he's not like that at all. He's like the stay with the doctrine and the principles doing his thing. I'm like the thinker and I like to think about everything everywhere. Um, and so he's my person that keeps me grounded and I appreciate Elder Eyring's words to, I'm going to reflect upon that and make sure that I stay grounded and be careful about what I say and what I'm teaching. Um, so I appreciated that. I always have things that whenever they say things I try to think, is that I like, do I need to do better at this? And I could do better at everything. Let's be honest. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I'm making my recordings, as my husband well knows, in the middle of the night, and I'm just trying to finish it, and I'll say all kinds of crazy things. So, don't ever take what I say too seriously, um, but you know that I have a testimony, and I want to share the words of Jesus Christ in the best way that I can, and I have a lot of excitement, and I love symbolism, and I love deep thinking, and just weaving the truths of the gospel into what it is that I'm sharing, and I really appreciate all of you guys in your comments and your participation and sharing learning. And do you have anything else to add before we wrap it up? Just such a treat to be here with you today. Um, <laughs> I am always uh, so appreciative of your inspiration and your hard work. Uh, you don't know this, but behind the scenes, uh, many, many hours go into researching, reading, and uh, watching many uh, videos across the internet so that you can bring all these wonderful insights to you. And uh, I, I think that's a big part of what they were trying to say in conference today to just, it's more than just showing up to church. It's more than just putting on a pretty face for others to look at. It's, it's this dedication and this love, this joy for the gospel. And I have always appreciate that that's what you have.
and, and so do you. And everybody mm -hmm. shows that we all have our talents and we all have different ways that we show that. And my husband does that by just being an amazing father. And if I'm trying to finish something up, he'll say, hey, I'm gonna make dinner while you finish up your video. <laughs> and he's so supportive. And I just, I cannot do it without him because we definitely have just everything going on all the time. We're super busy. And so we just support each other and our interests and our loves and what we're doing. And my husband is one of those people that he's like boots on the ground and he's working on the big, uh, the boys camp this summer. Is it, it's Captain Mer Camp Helaman. Camp Helaman. Yes. That's right. There. Mm -hmm. There's Camp Moroni and Camp Helaman. And so that's his big project that he is working on is he's setting that up for multiple stakes. And I'm doing my young woman's president thing. He's super supportive with that as well. And all of us as members of the church, we have so many things going on all the time, but we love it and it brings us joy. Amen. So, so thanks for joining us today.